look at the seven seals. Um, chapter chapters five to six. Chapter five is like an intro, introductionary chapter, but still of of, of, uh, of importance. And especially if we read what Sister White says, uh, quite interesting. Let us start with a word of prayer. Um, Father in heaven, I pray that you may be with us uh, during another class and that you may uh, speak to our hearts, uh, give us understanding, and I pray that you may help us to, um, yeah, help me to give the right words and, and teach us more things about you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so the seven seals. Um, Sister White, she has this to say about Revelation 5. The fifth chapter of Revelation needs to be closely studied. It is of great importance to those who shall act a part in the world, the work of God for these last days. There are some who are deceived. They do not realize what is coming on the earth. Those who have permitted their minds to be beclouded in regard to what constitutes sin are fearfully deceived. Unless they make a decided change, they will be found wanting when God pronounces judgment upon the children of men. They have transgressed the law and broken the everlasting covenant, and they will receive according to their works. She says, you know, this, this needs to be closely studied. Um, and uh, I've been trying to, to, to closely study Revelation 5, and uh, maybe there's, I mean, and I'm sure there's even more to what I have found so far. So, this is our words, and, and I believe... Uh, I believe that she's right. She's she's the prophet. So, um, so let us now start reading, uh, because we see here in in verse one it says, "And I saw the in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals." So at this time when 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 John got this, you know they have the. The, the most used thing to write on was the papyrus, the scrolls. And they, uh, at the most, they were like nine meters, each of them, uh, from what I, from what I uh, found out. And usually they were only written on one side. Here it says they were written on the back also, so it must be a lot of information. But uh, some say, well, the comma should be, should be after. Um, but uh, it seems like it would be, to be um, a book with a lot of information. And I think what, what is being seen here is a glimpse of what, we, what is found in, that, in, in this book with the seven seals. Mm -hmm. um, so, because it, some say, you know, the Greek expression that is for within and on the back side, side um, is to be understood together. So that's why uh, some say, well, no, Actually, this is what it says. It's on the, when the comma is right. It should be on the inside and on the out, on the on the back side. So that would mean it's a lot of a lot of text here in this scroll. And uh, in Revelation six, when we see the seven seals, it's quite short. So logically, it would be a lot more there, uh, also than what it said. Uh, and we see here that in yeah, you have the seven again. Uh, it's perfectly sealed. This book, sealed with seven seals. Now, in verse two, then there comes a question. Then I saw a strong angel. Um, oh, that's interesting. I just thought about Sister White uh, when she called a strong angel the one of the elders. Uh, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? Who is worthy? I mean, this is, was really a, an honest question. I mean, because no, it seemed like no one could was worthy. Um, and then we see here in, from verse 3, verse 3 and 4, it says, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read a scroll or to look at it. So this must have been pretty dramatic. When he, here John is in the vision, he's, he's weeping, he's, no one was worthy no, um, to even look at it and open it. Um, now, in verse 5, 
we see who is word. It says, but one of the elders, this is one of the verses we referred to earlier, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So Jesus is the only one where he says the, um, the root of David. In, in Romans he says uh, he's called, um, or sorry, in Matthew he's called the son of David, uh, Jesus. And because uh, Jesus was like a, a second David, David was like a type uh, of Christ. Uh, Jesus was the second man, as we saw yesterday, Adam meaning man, when he says he's the second Adam. So he's an he's a antitype of several of the people that have been before. Well, David, just like he restored the kingdom to Israel, Jesus came to restore back, uh, uh, restore us back to him. Verse 6. Um, verse 6 says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So you have here again, you have a lot of seven. Um, we have been talking about the seven spirits and the, the seven eyes here symbolizing the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And... Um, signifying the all-knowing all uh, part of God. and um, But then here we have, so John had just heard Christ being a lion. And then he turns and what does he see? What, do we, what does he see? He's, he sees a lamb. So he hears a lion, he sees a lamb. You see a lot of this in Revelation. He, he hears something and then he sees something, uh, you know, and many times different from what he, what logically would, would be there. Um, so this is this is the lamb, uh, Christ, signifying Christ, spotless character, perfect lamb, to humble himself to, to slaughter, for to gain victory and to to show his mercy to us. And it says here, as it had been slain. Obviously, this is not slain in heaven. This says as it had been slain. This is what he saw. Nothing is slain in heaven in that sense. Uh, but uh, this was. But anyhow, this is signifying that we are in the time frame of the crucifixion of Christ, right? He saw it there as it had been slain. So as we as we look at the seals, we are in the we are in in the uh, in the context of uh, of the cross. We'll see that later, um, because in verse six, verse one, it says, "Now I saw when the Lamb opened." So of the seals, referring to this lamb that as looked like as it had been slain. Um, in you see uh, here is a text a reference for you is Zechariah chapter four verse ten, talking about the eyes. It said, uh, "For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel." Zerubbabel, with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. You see, showing the all-knowing, the guy is all-knowing, through the Holy Spirit. Um, in Testimonies, didn't put it there, I think. Testimonies 4, page 395, 4395, says, He was shown to John as a lamb, that had been slain, as in the very act of pouring out his blood in the sinner's behalf. So that's what he saw. So it looks like he had reasonably been crucified here, as what he saw in the, in the, the time frame. Then in verse 7, then it, it says, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So Jesus, he was the only one worthy to do this. Um, what importance is this for you and me when we see this? He was the only one worthy to do it. And this is telling a lot. None other could do it but the Lamb of God. You know, um, so Jesus took this book. So 
knowing that he, only he could take it, it must mean something, something important. Mm -hmm. uh, we know Jesus is our judge. And this is a, a book, uh, among other things, describing um, sins of people. And it will, it will, I will show you in a moment when Ellen White refers uh, to, to those, you know, when it was decided, when they decided to crucify Christ. This was written in the book. But this is not what we see here when the seven seals are loose. That's why I believe that there are more things in this book than what is portrayed in chapter 6. So, Jesus uh, took this book, at least we can know from that quote from Sister White also that it's, uh, it's showing part of the destiny of humanity, of those who, she says, this, uh, those who decided to crucify Christ, one day they will, this will be shown like a panorama for them. So they, they will see this. I mean, this is written in this book. The fact that they did that. So, how will your sin appear to you when you behold the Lamb of God pouring out His, His blood for a sinner's behalf? You know, as we see the Lamb like this, as we see Christ like this, this is because of me. This is because of our sins, that he shed the blood. Now, let's see. Um, there is an article uh, by uh, Arthur, Arthur Keog, The Panorama of the Ages, it's called, uh, in Ministry Magazine. The Panorama of the Ages, you can find it online. It says, as we see the throne of God stained with the blood of the Lamb of God and realize the greatness of the love that offered pardon for every sin, how will our clinging to even the smallest sin then appear? Will it not appear as the treason and ingratitude that it is? As God's people today, we are called upon to sacrifice our time, our strength, and our means for the advancement of God's kingdom. But we often grumble and feel that too much is being asked of us. How shall we view our sacrifices in that day? You know, we, we too will see our lives in a panorama. Our actions are recorded in heaven. Um, and remember that when Christ, before Christ died, the angels, uh, they had still questions. We have been briefly talking about this. Uh, they, they had questions about... Um, yeah, about Lucifer and, and the fall of him and all these things and, and sin. And, um, but it wasn't until Jesus died upon the cross that some answers came. So, and because when they saw that Christ, the Lamb of God, chose to take the penalty of sinners upon him, that's when many of their questions were answered. As God showed this unconditional, endless love. A few quotes. The first one is on 761, three pages before this one you see there. Um, it says, in the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could never be obeyed. So it was one of the accusations, right? Um, that justice was inconsistent with mercy. And that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God would remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. When men broke the law of God and defiled his will, Satan exalted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed. Man could not be forgiven because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven. Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from the, God's favor. God could not be just, he urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. So a lot of accusations from Satan. And then three pages later, the survey is page 764. It says, or she says, Well then, might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross, for though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. So they still didn't understand everything, but a lot of questions were, were answered at the cross. 
Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when, uh, when upon the cross he cried out, it is finished. Let us read now, could someone of you read 8 verses 8 to 10? 8 to 10 in Revelation 5. Okay, read. Yeah. So, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Thank you. Um, yeah, so here, uh, here are some verses that uh, it looks like the elders are saying, you know, you have redeemed us by your blood and so on. And I, when I saw them, I was like, w wait a minute, this sounds, I mean, are, are they really, are they angels or are they humans? I mean, because if they're redeemed from the earth, there must be humans. Um, and these are uh, some verses, of course, that... That, that would um, support that they could be humans. And what I found is that, and in my Bible it says, it's referring to two different manuscripts that are using they and them instead of us and we in these, uh, in these verses here. With other words, the elders are talking about them and they, not us and we. That means then they are not the ones redeemed, they are talking about us, the humans. Uh, well, so, uh, like I said, to me, what I share with you regarding the, the elders, this is what has made more sense. I, I, I totally respect if, if people have other views. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, found, I, f I find that uh, with these two manuscripts that are using the they and them, it, it is in perfect harmony when Sister White says, refers to the elder that talked to John to, twice as an angel. And this is what makes me, me giving, or for me that's a big evidence. Um, but I, I respect if, if uh, people have different, I mean there are different views on this, I think at least three that I've heard. Um, but this is what have made the most sense uh, in my study. Okay. Um, now let's uh, just continue to read here, verse 11, let's read 11 to 14, could someone read that for us? And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels, round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, okay. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature, creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Mm. See a lot of praise here. The angels are joining, all the angels are joining in the praise. And um, one day all, um, all created beings one day will finally recognize the righteousness, that God is righteous. Um, now, this is a picture I took, I think it was in 2011 now. Finally, I got to use this illustration. It per fits perfectly with what's happening here. Uh, and you see this? I don't know what is put in this bucket, but you see that basically bees are flying in there and they're dying. Okay? Um, we know that and probably something sweet. I mean, they like sweet stuff, so I guess something sweet in there. It looks like maybe honey and water or something. Uh, now, when Satan sinned in heaven, he was like a magnet so all, to many angels that were just you know, going with him, jumping into a bucket like this, the bucket of sin, if you will. Okay, and they were, they were expelled from heaven, and Satan was, was you know, casting, cast down on this earth while the angels had questions, obviously. 
you know, what's going on? What is this? I mean, we don't understand all these things. And, and, and you know, he's accusing God for this and that. I mean, a big crisis in heaven. Now, then God created a man with a free will, right? And, uh, and, and man, uh, tempted man and man fell. We know that. So now humanity jumped into this bucket of sin. You know, even though it's kind of weird. You see, this, this bee here, he's seeing all the other ones down there dying, but still he's going in there. I mean, well, everyone else is doing it. This is, what, this is how we are reasoning almost sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone is doing this. Even though, well, it it's, looks like there's some danger there, but I mean, everyone is doing it. It looks normal. I'm going to do it too. So this is how, kind of how we have been doing as humans. We are jumping into the bucket of sin, even though we see the dangers. Um, we, yeah, we, we are, I mean, it's, 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 it's smelling sweet here. It, it's something good about that. So we are, we're jumping into the bucket. And this bucket is leading to our death. And, but then Christ said, you know what? I'm going to jump into this bucket. I'm going to save you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm going to come down here where you guys are dying. I'm going to die for you so you can live eternally. Isn't that wonderful? Christ jumped into our bucket of sin, if you will. Um, and uh, in the first selected messages, page 268, Spirit of Prophecy says, In what contrast is the second Adam as he entered the gloomy wilderness to cope with Satan single-handed? Since, uh, since the fall, the race had been de decreasing in, in size and physical strength and sinking lower in the scale of moral worth up to the period of Christ's advent to the earth. And in order to elevate fallen man, Christ must reach him where he was. He took human nature and bore the infirmities and uh, degeneracy of the race. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is what Christ was doing. He humiliated himself to the lowest depths of human woe that he might be qualified to reach man and bring him up from the degradation in, in which sin had plunged him. So it's amazing. Christ who knew no sin became sin for us that we may be right, made righteous in, in his blood. Now, so he is worthy to open the scroll, the book containing important things, um, uh, important parts of the history. Now, in the book in heaven that is written with, with, with the things of, of your life, where is your case? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Um, now, chapter 6, we, we, are, we, we see in verse 1, as I referred to earlier, uh, it says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. So now he's opening. We're in the same, we're on, we're on the same time frame uh, as when John saw the, the Lamb as it was slain. And then why did he described this um, in more in detail. So we're, we're in the time frame of, of the cross here as the seals are opened. And here I have the, the quote, Christ's on page 294. She says there, referring to the Jewish leaders, the decision, and again to cru crucify Christ, he's talking about earlier, was re registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne. The book which no one could open, in all its vindic vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the line of the tribe of Judah. So this was put in the book. So it must be a whole lot more stuff in the book, and we will see a glimpse of it when, we op when the seals are open. The seven seals. So... This is all, all that is happening is going to be brought to light on the, on the great judgment day. And we, I mean, we are going to see, as El White describes things, in, in, pan, in panoramic views. And we know that we, the saints, will be part, part of the judgment in heaven. And they're, you know, they're going to look at each case and see and, and, and affirm, okay, God, God was, he was just here. He tried everything. And, and this person had, had really decided with his actions. Um, 
Now, great controversy, page 666. Uh, we have an interesting quote. <laughs> I think it's the first time I'm referring to such a reference. Uh, <laughs> so listen what it says there on that page. And this is um, talking about after, after a thousand years. Above the throne is revealed the cross, and like a panoramic view appear the scenes of Adam's temptation and fall, and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. The Savior's lowly birth, his early life of simplicity and obedience, his baptism in Jordan, the fast and temptation in the wilderness, his public ministry, and falling to men, heaven's most precious blessings, the days crowd, crowded with the deeds of love and mercy, the nights of prayer and watching in the solitude of the mountains, the plotting of envy, hate and malice, which repaid his benefits, the awful mysterious ag agony in Gethsemane, Beneath the crushing weight of the sins of the world, his betrayal into the hands of the murderous mob, the fearful events of that night of horror, the unresisting prisoner, forsaken by his best-loved disciples, rudely hurried through the streets of Jerusalem, the Son of God exultingly displayed before Annas, arraigned in the high priest's palace, in the judgment hall of Pilate before the cowardly and cruel Herod, mocked, insulted, tortured, and condemned to die, all are vividly portrayed. So we are, we are going to be able to see this one day, you know, how, how this happened. And um, it's going to be shown in a pan panoramic view from the, the scenes of Satan's temptation and fall and, and on the Christ and, and how they crucified him, and the, how this was decided and what people did to him. Um, and then we have a, a few other quotes here from... Uh, Review and Herald, the member 4, 1884. Um, I'll read uh, January 1 first uh, from the same year. When the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened, there will be many astonishing disclosures. Men will not then appear as they appear to the human eyes and finite judgments. Secret sins will then be laid open to view of all. That's pretty serious. I mean, then knowing that other people, will, you know, they're going to see your, your life or secret or secrets, or secret sins, if we have. Then she says in November 4, the mind will recall all the thoughts and acts of the past. The whole life will come in review like the scenes in a panorama. Thus everyone will be condemned or acquitted, acquit acquitted out of his own mouth, and the righteousness of God will be vindicated. So how is your life panorama going to look like? That's, uh, that's an important question. Um, so basically... Uh, the seven seals, we, we are, we're, we're going to look at, uh, this is taking a look at, again, the history. Uh, Matthew Henry says is, is going through the history of the Christian era, uh, um, which is, has his Bible commentary, for those who don't know. And, um, and we see Sister White, that uh, she, she made this, um, this comment about the decision to crucify Christ was written in this book. And uh, then we'll see uh, a little bit later, but we will see that this, this fits to, to almost the same time periods as the, as the, the, the churches. Uh, but it's following the same, the, the same historical sequence, at least. Okay, so uh, could someone read verse 2, chapter 6, verse 2. Here we get started. And I saw an eagle, a white horse, and did not sat on it at the door. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, conquering and to conquer. All right, so we see here, uh, often the, we have, we are going to have four horses here in four seals. The first one, a white one. This is often referred to the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, what is a horse a symbol of? What is a horse a symbol of? Strength. Huh? Strength. Strength. Yeah. Well, it could be. Um, we see in in Proverbs chapter. Let's see if I have it here. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, Proverbs chapter twenty-one, verse thirty-one. It says, "The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord." So, horse is a symbol of war, battle. Um, 
And we're going to see here the four horsemen is representing the times of church history as, 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 uh, as you had uh, wars against the church. I mean, you have the church not only gathered in, in one body, but, you know, we, we know the history from the, from the seven churches from earlier. Uh, so you're going to see here uh, uh, how these this, this churches, these believers, as they go, go to battle their enemies, and spir like spiritually. And well, we also know that literally there, was, there have been wars also. Um, so the, the horses here will have different colors. The first one is white, which we all know is, is a symbol of what? Purity. So uh, referring here to the church, with purity, purity of faith. Christ was, you know, he, he, he won. We have the context here of, of, of Christ, the lamb that was slain, right? He had just won the victory on behalf of all believers. So the first one is representing what period of the church, you think? Logically. Apostolic. Yeah. So that would be the apostolic. Uh, the, the, we can say the, the victorious church. Um, so... Then in, in Revelation 19, verse, verse 8, here's a reference if you want, talking about the, the, the clothes. I mean, um, it says, um, talking about she, referring to the, the saints, he was gonna be, she was going to be clothed in white. And the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So, and then it said here that uh, he that was on the horse had a, had, a, had a crown, a crown on the bow. So crown... Here again we have this crown, this Stephanos crown, symbolizing victory, which Jesus won uh, and as he established his, his kingdom. The, the gospel spread rapidly, as we know, and uh, in, in uh, Revelation 19.11, he's talking about the white horse, and he that sat upon the horse was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So, Jesus started... Uh, the Christian movement here on earth and we have um, we have this this purity of the apostles you know they were spending a lot of time in prayer prayer was important for them unity was important how much do, do you long for this purity that we saw in the first Christians you know we need to get back to this purity and we know as, as they received the, the, the former rain we if we are faithful and if we are praying for rain we'll one day receive the latter rain. But until then, God needs to work with our characters. We need to, God wants to make us pure. Mm. And an uh, interesting story from, on, on this topic from in the 1930s was uh, uh, this Norwegian missionary. Her name is uh, <coughs> uh, Maria Monsen. Maria uh, Monsen. She, she was, you know, she was a praying woman. She was really a sincere believer, and she longed to see, you know, God's uh, river of life flood to spiritually dry China. So she was a missionary in China, and she was. Um, she had this this big river there, uh, which is called Yangtze, and she she was realizing how this river started with a few drops that came together, and more and more, and she longed to see, you know, the drops of of the water of, of life come together, the water of revival uh, come together. And she looked for a prayer partner that could, that could join her in claiming the promise where two or three, what, what if two of you, sorry, if this one is from Matthew 18, 19, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And finally, she found another person that would like to claim this promise with her. So she, she shouted, the revival has begun. You know, there were only two claiming this. She was so firm believing this. This is going to, God is going to answer her prayers. She said, an awakening has begun. And the raindrops of, of revival uh, uh, were, were coming together. Now, in November uh, this year, she, she announced, she said this, a, a great revival will come to the North China Mission. And... If, you know, she was convinced that the missionaries in this area, they were fulfilling the conditions of revival. And there are conditions in the Word of God for revival. Now, you have, for instance, Second Chronicles 7, 14. I think we heard it here earlier in the week. I um, can't remember in what context now. Someone read it. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, huh? 
Eunice was in this. Uh, it was Eunice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, in, in 1932, two years later, 40 Christians were meeting daily to pray. Not only once, not only twice, not only thrice, but four times a day. They started at 5 a.m. in the morning. And, and you know, they, they were convicted of their sins. And, and you had, for instance, you had two men, they repented of hating one another. People were confessing sins for one another, and, and love was really growing strong and deep among them. And, and more people were baptized here than ever before in China. Uh, and like in one year, they were baptized more people than ever before in China. 3,000 people only surrendered, uh, surrendered to God only in one town, in one, one village. And you know, they really experienced a deeper Christian life. Um, and the Spirit was really, really poured out. And these prayer meetings, they lasted for two to three hours. <coughs> and as I hear stories from, you know, from revivals around the world, this is, this is the key that I see, prayer. Like the first church, the purity of the church, first church, and we can learn from them. They were praying. And this, the people that have experienced revival, they've been praying, you know, really seeking God. So before Jesus can come back, we need to go back to this. What we see in the first seal, this purity of, of the first church. Okay, so then we have the, the second seal, verse 3 to 4. Could someone read verses 3 to 4? Revelation 6, 3 to 4. Okay, uh, Talika. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, thank you. Um, so here, a horse, a red horse. What is red a symbol of? We have some references here. One is, huh? Yes, yeah, sin, sin and blood, sin and blood. You have the references there. Uh, I say one. 18, I say 63, 1 to 3. Um, so, and we, we know the history, no, we are a little bit familiar with history. We looked at the, the seven churches, right? And what happened, you know, after the, the first, you know, the apostolic movement and around after the year 100, what happened in history? Persecution. They were persecuted, right? Strong, heavily persecuted. Uh, and and we know how, uh, you know, they, they were... Yeah, they were persecuted both from heathens and from from um, from Jews, um, and uh, we we know also that that the Roman Church persecuted the Christians. So we see that um, the church faced some some struggles. Heresy was was on the way to come in in the church, and, and faith got corrupted. So we see the the red horse here, sin. Sin and blood, representing quite well that period. Um, and indeed, as it said here, it was supposed to take the peace from the earth. It certainly did. When the Roman emperors, you know, remember, you had this climax of the ten years, especially where they were heavily persecuted, uh, when, when they were, uh, you know, we had several emperors, especially during this time frame in the... In the 300, it was, it was horrible. Um, and then we have, the, he has a sword here, a sword. But, you know, naturally we would think, okay, sword, it's a word of God. And many times it is. But like, like in, in a, sometimes it's not always what we find a symbol of in, in one context. Uh, in here, in this context, it, it, there's an interesting uh, description will not take the time to go there, but I'll give the reference um, in Romans 13, in the first four verses there. And there you see it seems to be a symbol of the, the power of the government, how they are like a, almost a persecution from the government. They, they want to control in a sense, and this is exactly what happened there. They were, they were showing the, the power of the government against the, the Christians. Um, and remember in the, so here in the, I'll read what we read yesterday in Revelation 2, verse 10, from the 
the message to the church of Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and that they may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, but thou be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. See, we have this age of the martyrs here that were, um, the Constantine came and, and mixed uh, paganism with Christianity. And this is what we see uh, even more in the next, um, the next horse, the next time, the, the third seal. Now we have a black horse. Let's see, uh, verse 5 to 6. Who would like to read verse 5 to 6? Or some of our brothers from Kenya, maybe? Eat these. And when he had opened the dungeon, I had the dungeon say, Come and see. And I returned and drove a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Mm -hmm. And verse 6. Verse 6 says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the forties say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of value for a penny, and see thou hast not the oil and the wine. Thank you. All right, so here we have a black horse. Um, you know, this, these horses are just getting. You know, uh, the color is just turning uh, uh, darker and darker. And now we have this black horse and black. If white was the color of purity, what would black be? I mean, what would that be representing? Yeah, yeah like, yeah, like darkness. Like we had hedonism come more and more in and corrupted completely the, the church. And uh, we have what is opposite now to the Christian purity that we had in, in the first, first seal. And then it says a pair of balances. The Greek for this word can, uh, actually means a uh, yoke. A yoke was, was, was there. Um, at this time we know that the church and state was, was combined through Constantine. And uh, a spiritual commercialism was taking over in the church. And, you had, you know, a lot of things with the, with the hedonism brought in um, and substitutes for the commands of God was, was starting to come in to the church. Uh, it says a measure or a quarter. This is the same amount of grain as a one, like a, a day, one day's ration of food uh, for a working man. And then it says one penny or in some denarius. And this is for a Roman one penny represented one day's wages for an ordinary laborer. We see that, for instance, in, in Matthew 20, uh, 20 verse, verse 2, uh, when you know, we have the laborers in the, in the vineyard, and they received a penny, a penny a day. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at the, what it says here about the, the grain, it said, yeah, so for the, for, for the barley, um, you see, the price that it will be here um, is actually quite expensive, the price for getting these this grains. And if you compare it with this one historian, uh, Cicero, he, uh, he says that it, I mean, this would be 8, to, eight to, to 16 times the normal prices from this, from this time, signifying, signifying a, a famine. A famine or shortage of supply and we know that this time it was if you think spiritually it was uh, a famine of the Word of God if you will uh, and uh, as they as the more the church was just totally corrupt uh, and uh, you had this time those so-called sects they had to submit their creeds to, to the um, to the Emperor uh, and you know, you know, things were controlled. If you were not part of the, the Roman Church, things were completely controlled. Uh, the the so the so-called sects they lost their right to meet. So a lot of things happened. You know, freedom was in general taken away 
in many ways regarding worship. Um, so the faith was more governed from the church as it was connected with the state. So Jesus, the bread of life, had, been, had become commercialized. And then he said here that, do not harm the oil and the wine. What is that a symbol of? The oil and the wine. We, have, we know the oil is a symbol of what? Holy the Holy Spirit. We, have, we know that from Zechariah chapter 4. And the wine is a symbol of the blood of, the blood of Christ. So, um, this is an important foundation, foundation to have in, the, in our Christian faith. So, so, this was not to be hurt. And uh, um, this was needed to be pre uh, preserved, according to this text. And uh, Ellen White, she, she talks uh, in, a, in a context here regarding, regarding this, this phrase here. She says, in order to secure a man to himself and ensure the, his eternal salvation, it's from Testimonies 5, 6, 14, Christ left the royal courts of heaven and came to this earth, endured his, the agonies of sin, and shame in man's stead, and died to make him free. In view of the infinite price paid for man's redemption, how dare any professing the name of Christ treat with indifference one of his little ones? How carefully should brethren and sisters in the church guard every word and action, lest they hurt the oil and the wine? So rather right she's talking about living up to the name of being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, and not treating people with indifference. So, so by, by treating people badly, if you will, or, or not treating them as they deserve, that would hurt the oil and the wine, according, according to Sister White. How patiently, kindly, and affectionately should they deal with the purchase of the blood of Christ? Right, so she connects this here. How faithfully and earnestly should they labor to lift up the desponding and the discouraged? How tenderly should they treat those who are trying to obey the truth and have no encouragement at home, who have constantly to breathe the atmosphere of unbelief and darkness. So let us not hurt the oil or the wine. Uh, remember how important role you have in salvation. We play an important role and, and also what we have, whatever we have done to the, to, the, to the small ones we have done to Christ. And whoever it would be. So we know that... Um, this, this church was really just going down and down, and now we come to the fourth seal, and uh, it says in, in verse 7 and 8, When I opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and with, uh, and by the beasts of the earth. Okay, so pale horse now. What, what could, I mean, what is, what does this mean? Pale. If you're pale in your face, what would that? Say? If you saw someone that was pale in the face, huh? Fear. Yeah, right. Your fear or, or, or dead. Fear, fear and death. Um, and even the name of the rider here was death. And then it's talking about the fourth part. Again, I don't think that's literally. It's showing how uh, more of the, there's a wide area, more un universally. And we know this is describing uh, basically from the Dark Ages that was indeed very dark. And it was just dead. Uh, people died not only literally, but the, the faith was completely dead in the, in the Roman church. Um, of course, there's always exceptions, but we know that between 50 and 150 million people died as a result of their persecution. Horrible. Um, and they, you know, they took properties, conf confiscated things, and hum hunger became a problem. And, but then there's, it says here that uh, he killed, killed with a sword, with hunger, uh, with death. Um, if you read the, the Hebrew version of the New Testament, it will say pestilence. So, I mean, to killing with death sounds a little bit weird. So, I think maybe pestilence seems to be a more fitting word here. Um, the Bible, as we know, was forbidden for the people. 
at this time as well. And here uh, I read this sentence in, in, a, in a commentary from Amazing Discoveries. I thought it explained it very well. Whenever the church takes up the sword to coerce with the, with the conscience, a famine of God's word results. And so that basically happened. I mean, they took up the sword and, you know, the word was put aside uh, completely. It was a famine for God's word. People, I mean, people didn't get the word. Okay, so now we're at the fifth church, uh, sorry, fifth seal. Um, okay, if you are, I mean, I encourage you to study this, uh, but if, if you're a little bit unsure, man, are we really, are we really at the right time frame here? Because some, there would be some that, 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 that maybe would put the seals in, in another time frame of history. But here, the fifth seal, this is like a, another checkpoint. You're like, okay, that's it. I, I mean, it, it must be, we are, we are at, at the right sequence here. We're at the right, the right event. Because we read in verses 9 to 11, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou now judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. I, I imagine John now, when he hears this, he, he is comforted, because all his... I mean, many of his, his friends, they had to die as martyrs, the disciples, right? And he hears these words, and he thinks, praise the Lord. It's the, I mean, there is hope after, the, after death. And, um, <clears throat> um, and in the sanctuary, we, we knew that we, with some offerings, the, the blood was supposed to be poured out by the altar. Now, here, it's talking about, um, we see souls. And what is a soul, according to the Word of God? A soul. You have some references there to help you. What is a soul? The body with the what? Like the body with the breath? Yes, exactly. So, yeah, yeah so, now, so we have Genesis 2-4. Uh, talking about how God, when God created, um, when God created the human being, and he, he, he formed a man from the dust of the ground, and then they gave the breath and it became a soul, it became a living being. So, and then we have in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, uh, I think I put the wrong there again. It's supposed to be Acts chapter 2, I think, this one here. Well, anyhow, in Acts is talking about, you know, the soul, so many souls were added to the church. It's referring, can refer to human beings. So here, when it says the souls are crying out, um, or the souls, no, it's not the souls are crying out, the souls of those who have been slain, talking about it here, then it says, when it says, and they cried with a loud voice. Now, how, I mean, what is this meaning? How are they crying out if they were slain, if they were dead? Huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, this could be... I mean, people could use this for, for ideas like that. I mean, why, why is it saying it like this? Souls, they are crying out. They're dead. I mean, how, how do you explain this? They're a minor of them. Okay, yeah, read. <clears throat> well, so how I understand it is um, in the book of Genesis, when Cain kills Abel, God comes to him and he says, Your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. The ground is actually not crying physically. Mm -hmm. But it's just an evidence of what has happened, and we're waiting for retribution. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how it's. And there's another reference somewhere as well, maybe Hebrews, I think. Yep, here we have them. So exactly, you, you, you have one there that you refer to the blood is oh. crying out. Yeah. It's uh, like the evidence of something that happened, right? Uh, innocent blood was shed in, in, in that sense, and it's, it's a witness. Mm -hmm. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, it's talking about. Um, but Jesus' blood, it says, um, it says, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things that, than that of Abel. 
So we know that the blood in the sanctuary was, was representing Jesus, right? And what he, he shed his blood. That was poured, that was poured by the altar. Uh, so this is symbol. This is describing, you know, or if I, if I understand a sanctuary, we may understand then why it is written like this. So it's a witness. The, the blood of those that were uh, that were that were killed is crying out. It's a witness for what, what happened, and, and and so we have to understand that it's not talking about, you know, in literal terms, uh, as as Revelation is a symbolic book. Um, and we know that the papacy killed millions and millions of people that would not renounce their belief in the Bible and the Bible alone. So there are martyrs in all ages that are crying out, uh, or whose blood is crying out for justice. The blood is crying out for justice uh, and vindication of the truth, uh, the truth for which they died for. So um, we know what the Bible teaches about death. Uh, we have some references to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. We know that the blood, uh, the, 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 the dead in Christ will, will, will rise at, when, when Christ comes back and so on. But, so it's, when it says, rest yet for a little season. So here's the reassurance. This is the, the assurance that God ultimately will triumph. Rest a little season. So it says... And they cried out with a loud voice, verse 10, How long, O Lord? That the, so it's a question as well as we have, you know, regarding the judgment. How long? In Daniel 8, 13, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, Then a white robe was given uh, to them, each of them, and it was said to them to rest a little while longer. So this is referring to the judgment again. So we know that, and we know that the judgment started in 1844. Mm -hmm. So we know that we are not, when it says rest a little season, we know that, we are, we, are, we are about right now that we come to, to this period of the history uh, with, with this fifth seal. So, in, we also have here a quote from Ellen White, from Manuscript 39 from 1906. She says, When the fifth seal was open, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. After this came the scenes described in the 18th chapter in Revelation, when those who are faithful and true are called out from Babylon. So she says this is before uh, what is taking place in Revelation 18. This is the second calling out of Babylon. Uh, so we know, uh, again, from this reference also, that we, we are right time-wise here because this, this will come, this, this message here the proclamation of Revelation 18 and, and God is revealing his character through all, throughout the earth um, the last chance uh, for the world to, 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 to go, go out from, from Babylon so that means that the door of mercy is not yet shut at that time and that is also right before the seven last plagues um, We'll, we'll also cover. Um, do you think that there's a chance that you will die as a martyr? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, yeah, that could become a reality for all of us in here. If we are faithful to God. Because as you see how things are developing in the world, in politics, in church, church and state, uh, you know, closer connections in some places. It's not hard to imagine that uh, soon some of us will be martyrs. Mm. That's uh, <laughs> it's interesting to think about. It's coming closer. The end of times are coming closer. Now, verse 12. Can someone read verse 12 for us? Now we're in the sixth seal. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood all right what do we know about this do we do we have have some of this happened in history yes okay so so what happened has has there been like a big earthquake yes. in lisbon all right so in in uh, do you remember the year okay so we have the Lisbon earthquake in 17, 
1955, a great earthquake killing more than 100,000 people. And you could even feel it in North Africa and in, West, in the West Indies. And uh, 90,000 died in Portugal out of this. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Big, huge. And then it says that the sun was going to turn black and the moon red. So a little bit later, in, in, in 1780, and uh, by the way, it's written about this in Matthew 24 as well. It says in 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of, of the heavens shall be shaken. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. So in 1780, we know that, that the, the persecution was cut short, as it was prophesied. Um, and in New England, on May 19, 1780, an unusual darkness appeared. For several hours of the day, it was dark. And, and for several days before that, the, the, the sun had been, been red. But then on this day, it was dark. And in the same night, the moon turned to blood. So it started about 10 o'clock in the morning and um, with, with, the, with the sun being dark for several hours. And, um, and then the moon became red. So right when it was predicted, this came. But then we have, as we read in Matthew, 24, in verse 13 here in uh, Revelation 6, it says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Well, we have in November 13, 1833, a great falling, uh, falling of stars, like the most extensive display ever recorded of stars falling. I mean, that must have been wonderful to watch. Um, so we have the sequence have been followed in history. You see that it has had these signs have had the sequence, and it could even be that we will see some of these things uh, happen again. I mean, we have had the the, the red moon also uh, had this year. Did some of you see it? Or no? It was the sorry. It was the we had the the solar eclipse. Yeah, but the but we also had the the moon, didn't we? Was it this year? It was. I think I took picture of that one. Uh, anyhow, I got some pictures. Yeah, I think I got a little bit from them, and then from the solar eclipse, I got some nice shots of the the, the the dark sun there. But I mean, what we saw here earlier in history, and this was not expected to come. So, all right. Um, but what happens now? From from now on, after thirteen, is yet future. Because in 14 it says, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So, as it said in Matthew 24, the, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And in verse, in verse 16, you get in Revelation 6, it says, uh, and, um, uh, Sorry if... Uh, 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and, and rocks, Fall on us and hide on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is describing that group that will not be caught up in, in the sky with, with, with Christ. There are going to be two groups. This is the group, and one group will say, oh, here's my God that I've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. and then you have this group and said, you know, I, 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 trying everything they can to hide. They just can't stand uh, as, as, as Christ is, is coming. And, uh, and uh, we have <coughs> yeah, <it's coughs> the reference for the saved ones in Isaiah 25, verse 9. It says, it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So I say at 25.9 if you want the reference. So there's still time. There's still time. Um, but the time is, is short for, for repentance. Um, so basically, those who repent, um, God gives forgiveness and, and cleansing. But those who do not, those who persist in evil, uh, they will be experiencing the second death, uh, finally.
So we have a choice. All of us have a choice. Now, this was the end of Revelation 6. But what about the seventh seal? It's not coming until chapter 8. Why is that? We have a break here. Revelation 7. I mean, why? What, what is this? Because in, in Re Revelation 7, it starts like this. And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, on the any tree. Why, why, is there, why is this is the break in the whole chapter until we get to the seventh seal? What do you think? See, we had a question here in the last verse of Revelation 6. And what was the question? Who is able to stand? And this question is answered in Revelation 7. Talking about the 144,000. They, they, they are able to stand through the blood of Christ. Because they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Right? And then we come to Revelation 8. After this question is addressed very thoroughly... <clears throat> then we come to Revelation 8. Um, and uh, we see that the 144,000 has been sealed. And the ones who will be, are able to stand, they uh, are now sealed. And these are able to stand through the last, the last plagues on this earth. Uh, the, the seven last plagues that we will address. So then, now in Revelation 8, verse 1, he says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then after that, the trumpets come. Okay, that's it. <laughs> it was short seal. So, what does this mean? You know, because we see in, in Revelation 6, Basically, the, the, the end of the world is, is, is described. Mm. But then in... in uh, so this, is, this covers the sixth seal, the end of the world. But then the seventh seal says it was silence in heaven for half an hour. So if, if Revelation 6 is about the end, uh, the end of the world, the sixth seal is about the end of the world, the seventh seal, what, I mean, what would that logically be? There's still something important to, to take place. And in the si seventh seal... Uh, as we have seen now in several chapters, you know, the angels in heaven are constantly giving praise to God, like over and over again. It's, it's, it's joy and, 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 and gladness in heaven. Of course, they're also sad for us down here on earth, but they're praising God. But now it was silent in heaven. And there, was, there are a few different theories what why this is. Some say, well, they are all in awe of what was happening here on earth, and they're like, Closely following, but but then there's another uh, theory that I, I think makes makes sense makes more sense, um, and uh, for instance Ellen White she says this: We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our on our heads. Now this half an hour, if you would take this into into prophetic time, that would be about a week. A week, but it says um, about half an hour. That was the silence. About half an hour, mm -hmm. and it will take a week for us to go up to he to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll get a tour on our way there. That's why we need some time. Uh, well, it's uh, it has its purpose with the with the seven days. Uh, so when it says about a week. So uh, this theory would say that, well, because we, we know from, I, think I, I don't think I put that there, Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him. So all the angels will come with Jesus as He is coming. That's why it's silent. And it's going to be silent for about half an hour, about seven days, if we take it in prophetic terms. Now this is not like a time setting from this time to that time, like that, because we don't know, I mean, there should be time no longer. Mm -hmm. But the amount of time here, if you take it prophetic, uh, is, it would be uh, uh, seven days. So about seven days, if we interpret it that way, that's what it will take. Christ comes with his angels, and we 
and when we get up with him for the seven days. Jesus says in Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Are you ready to meet your Savior? Do you want to belong to this group that are able to stand when the Lamb comes? How many of you want to fight for this, be in this group? Amen. Mm -hmm.